He said tomorrow can be our Independence Day. So we're going to talk to Lord Monkton about that. So we have an introduction, of course. If you're a listener to InfoWars.com, you've heard him on many times. We have uh, Lord Monkton on to talk. He is an expert on global warming. He's been very effective at fighting the lies of Al Gore and others, uh, the censorship that we see uh, s surrounding uh, man-made global warming narratives. Uh, he's done that in the UK. Of course, he's also a businessman. He's a newspaper editor. He's an inventor, a classical architect, and of course, the high priest of climate skepticism. But today, we're going to talk to him about what's going on with globalism. Also, if you want to uh, find Lord Monckton, you can find him at scienceandpublicpolicy.org, where you'll find many of his papers uh, published, and whatsupwiththat.com, where you'll find information uh, where he exposes the lies of climate alarmism. But today we're going to talk about Brexit. We're going to talk about the economic issues. We're going to talk about the sovereignty issues. We're going to talk about the political consequences, both in Britain and in the United States, because this is a worldwide issue that is happening right now. Joining us now is Lord Christopher Monckton. Thank you for joining us, Lord Monckton. Well, David, it's a pleasure to be with you. And my goodness, it's exciting here because I can't tell you who is going to win this vote tomorrow. I hope it's going to be the Brexiteers. Uh, I've already cast my vote by post, but it's too close to call. It could go either way. But you're quite right in your introduction and in that wonderful film and all of the people that, who you, you showed clips of are friends of mine. Um, this is an enormous blow. The fact that we've even got this referendum is an enormous blow against global government power. Yeah. They didn't ever want us to have this vote. And at least we've got the chance to have our say. And it's very evenly divided between, roughly speaking, the left and the center right, between the establishment and the ordinary folk, between the givers and the gobblers, to use the uh, eight <laughs> rands uh, metric. And what is fascinating is that practically the entire global establishment, so terrified are they, are they at the idea of Britain leaving the EU, that we've had Mr. Obama speaking out, we've had Angela Merkel, the uh, president of Germany, speaking out, we've had, or the chancellor, as she's called, we've had uh, Francois Hollande speaking out, we've had the head of the World Bank speaking out, we've had all manner with the, the head of the Bank of England, who is not allowed to speak out of political matters, he has spoken out, and all of these are, of course, wanting us to stay in because they want to tie us in to this increasingly globalized government system. And, yes, and further and away, further away, we have no control over what's going on in your lives. And I think that's the key phrase there, that rousing speech that was given by Boris Johnson, where he says, tomorrow can be our Independence Day. I mean, do Britons really want to govern themselves or do they want to be governed by some European super state that is dominated by the Germans? I, I really don't understand that. I mean, there was a, a back and forth talking about Neville Chamberlain and, and they made a good uh, point on that the other day when they, they questioned uh, Cameron on that. I want to play that clip and get your reactions to it. But I, I see that as a, another issue of uh, appeasement and surrender. That is a very fair comparison. And of course, the entire establishment throughout Europe was for appeasement in the, uh, in the era immediately before the Second World War. And I'll bet you'll never guess which the first state to speak out against Hitler openly and publicly was. What was that? It was actually the Holy See. It was, it was the uh, hmm. Pope Pius XII, as he was to become, he was then secretary to Pope Pius XI, who issued in German an encyclical letter, the first time it hadn't been in Latin since the early Middle Ages, and it was called Mit Brennen der Sorge, with profound concern. The Holy See spoke out against the Hitler regime, while everybody else, the Times of London, was for appeasement. I mean, indeed, the Daily Express in 1933 had disgraced itself by running a front page story shortly after Hitler came to power saying Germany is Britain's friend. And the author of its lead story was not one of its journalists, it was Joseph Goebbels. That was <laughs> how much the establishment wanted the, the, the German Reich to survive and prosper. And now they want the new bureaucratic, the, the tyranny by Clark, which again is anti, it's not just undemocratic, it's anti-democratic. 
And again, the establishment, which now hates democracy, viscerally hates democracy, wants to use the EU as a model for spreading effectively dictatorship worldwide. And you're quite right, David, when you say that democracy and independence are the issue. Are we going to be once again a sovereign nation? Are we going to get our independence back? And when you think that Britain was a great, proud and independent nation, the last time anyone invaded us was in 1066 AD. And now here we have the European Union invading us by stealth. Yeah. And, of course, about half the population will tend to side with the establishment, uh, the gobblers, the people who are on the take. They love the EU because it's a paradise of vested interests. Uh, there are 20,000 lobbyists who infest Brussels and Strasbourg, and their job is to argue for various vested interests to get free handouts from the European Union, of course, at British and other taxpayers' expense. And how much say do we get in any of this? It gets back to your point, David, about democracy and independence. At the moment, according to the House of Commons Library, which has just done a survey, three laws in five that are made for us by our Parliament in the United Kingdom are in fact only made because Brussels says we must make those laws. Wow. These laws are being enacted because the European Union's commissars 28 unelected people who meet behind closed doors have issued what is revealingly called a directive, which we are then obliged, under pain of unlimited and continuing fines, to enact into law in the United Kingdom. Now, the German government did a survey five years ago, and its conclusion, which was put in front of its constitutional court at the time, which had insisted that this sum be done, they said that, in fact, five-sixths of all laws, five laws in six, not even two in three, but five in six, Wow. were in fact uh, enacted solely because directives by the unelected, unremovable, unaccountable, unquestionable commissars uh, had, had ordered these laws to be made. That is how far from democracy we are. Now you may say, oh, but I've heard of a thing called the European Parliament. Well, don't imagine that that is anything like a parliament. It is a fig leaf to cover the naked dictatorship behind. And this parliament cannot even bring forward a bill. Can you imagine if the United States had set up a constitution whereby the Congress was not allowed in either house ever to bring forward any new legislation? We're getting the close European to parliament that. Isn't allowed, <laughs> yes, the European parliament, of course you are under Obama getting used to that, but um, that's not how it was supposed to work. Under that's the right, that's right. And yet the, the constitution of Europe is that the supreme law of Europe is proposed behind closed doors by the 28 commissars, is drafted behind closed doors by a committee called the uh, Council of Ministers, which doesn't actually have any ministers on it, it's entirely bureaucrats. There's also a rather shadowy group called the Council of Permanent Representatives, another lot of bureaucrats that have their say. Then and only then it goes to the European Parliament. And of course, if uh, right at the outset the commissars have decided to veto whatever law it was, then the European Parliament doesn't get its say at all. So uh, this shows how undemocratic it is. And if the European Parliament should agree to the law proposed by the commissars, well, then it gets inflicted on us. But if they disagree, it gets inflicted on us anyway, because the commissars have and frequently exercise the right under the Treaty of Maastricht in five different places, it says this, to override, the unelected commissars can override the decisions of the elected Parliament of Europe. So this is a, an entirely anti-democratic constitution. In fact, it's very like the Soviet constitution on which it was modelled. And all that's happened is the Soviet constitution has moved westward. And we are now effectively the European Supreme Soviet. And I would it add, Lord Moncton, and I would add, Lord Moncton, that what we are now looking at with the Trans-Pacific and the Transatlantic Partnership, Senator Sessions, who's one of the and the only senator that I know that actually looked at the agreement has essentially said, we're going to have the same thing with these trade agreements where we're going to have an unelected, unaccountable uh, bureaucracy that is going to be able to alter these things at will. There will be a living document and we will have absolutely no control over them. So what you just described there in the European Union, uh, where they can override all these deals. And of course, it's always about the money. They, they sell this as an economic uh, opportunity as an economic union, but then they use it to take our sovereignty. As Boris Johnson has said, and he's been one of the key voices on this, he says, we remain prisoners of a trade regime 
that will not allow this country, the fifth biggest economy on earth, to negotiate with America, China, India, or any other nation. He says that privilege is reserved exclusively for the hierarchies of the European Commission, of whose vast staff only 3.6% are British. Now, if they get this trans-Pacific, transatlantic partnership, that will go from 3.6% to 0% for you. It'll go to 0% for America. We will have no say over the trade issues for our countries. That's right. Now, we, we now have to do something about this. Of course, in Britain, uh, if anybody is listening to this from Britain, for heaven's sake, if you still believe in democracy, and a surprising number don't, but if you do, then for heaven's sake, you have to vote leave. It is as simple as that. Don't be fooled by all the economic arguments that uh, the Treasury has simply made up numbers to try and say we would go bankrupt if we were out of the EU. We'll go bankrupt for sure if we're in it. Let me give you one figure that tells you just how badly Britain has done in the EU. Hang on with that figure, Lord Martin. We've got to go to a commercial break and we'll be right back. And we also okay. have a clip we'll talk about... Uh, the other issue that came up in this, and of course, that is immigration. That has economic consequences, but it has vast consequences for the entire society. We'll talk about that when we come back with Lord Monckton. Brexit is tomorrow. Will it be Britain's Independence Day or the day they quietly cease to exist? We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, your host. We're going to go back to Lord Monckton. He had... Uh, we had to go to a commercial break. He had uh, one key factor that he wanted to tell us about with the Brexit. Of course, that's coming up tomorrow. The vote as to whether or not Britain will leave the European Union. Before we get back to Lord Monckton, I just want to let you know we do have a special, a new special at Infowars.com. Deep cleanse, 20% off at Infowarslife.com. Uh, this is a way to give yourself a foundation of true health by getting rid of the toxins in your body to clean your body you can look at the reviews on infowarslife.com we have over 105 star reviews find out what this product is about uh people love this and you can get it right now 20 percent off at infowarslife.com also our hillary for prison t-shirt uh such a great design that even our enemies at slate did a massive article on the effect that it had at a Donald Trump rally. And again, you can get these at 50% off. Uh, this is a one-week special, 50% off the first shirt and 75% off your second shirt. That's Hillary for Prison t-shirt. Let's go back to Lord Monckton. Uh, Lord Monckton, as we're going to the break, you uh, were about to uh, make a point. Go ahead. Yes, it's a very simple figure about the economics of all this, which needs to be looked at very briefly. And that is that in the last two decades, the, the stock market in London has had its worst two decades in 650 years of operation. Wow. That's, that's how well the EU has done for us. <laughs> uh, the EU has generally underperformed in the last 20 or 30 years just about all the other developed economies. And it is dragging all of us down with exactly this kind of bureaucratic mishmash of controls and regulations run by people we can't elect and can't remove that you talk of in the transatlantic trade uh, partnership uh, system. And what is happening here is that people like Mr. Obama, who have realized that communism is no longer popular, but who want to build in permacommunism into whatever they do, have discovered that if they make international treaties, either bilateral or multilateral, it doesn't very much matter. Under your constitution, those treaties have the force of supreme law in the United States. And they can't be repealed unilaterally as your, your own laws can. That's the different difference. And what is more, all the powers that are transferred, whether it be to the transatlantic trade partnership, whether it be to the European Stability Pact, the European Union, the World Bank, the World Law of the Sea Conference. It doesn't matter which of these entities it is. The UN is another one. There are a growing number of them, all of them very expensive. Not one of these supranational or global bodies has its governing council elected by us, the people of the states, parties, for the treaties that set those bodies up. So every time you transfer power from elected hands in the democracies to a global or supranational organization, you're transferring it from elected to unelected hands every time. So every time somebody says, oh, we've got a new wonderful treaty, you will know with a terrible certainty that another large piece of your democracy has been sliced away like a, a, a piece of salami. And this is the intention of the left now, is to govern 
entirely by dictatorship. And so far has it gone that to give you an example which is being mirrored in the transatlantic trade partnership, which is why I mention it to you uh, in America too, is that the European Stability Pact, to which Britain doesn't belong because we're not part of the failing euro currency zone, but the regulations, that the treaty that sets up that pact creates a governing council which can, at will, whenever it likes, call upon any of the member states of that um, group, the, the European Stability Pact, for unlimited amounts of money. And what is more, the people who are on this governing council, who are of course elected by nobody, they're so unaccountable that even if they decided to take the money and run off with it and put it into their bank accounts in the Cayman Islands or Switzerland or Belgium, which is now becoming <laughs> one of the biggest money laundering centers in the world, then the Stability Pact terms say that those people cannot be prosecuted and they cannot be sued in any civil court either. They are completely immune. They have absolute financial power over all the countries that, are, that belong to that treaty, absolute power, and even if they choose to exercise that power criminally, nobody can do anything to stop them. Wow. That is how, that, and that, of course, is That's dictatorship. Amazing in the formal sense. Well, now, of course, even though you're not in the, not a part of the euro, the mismanagement of the euro is driving immigration from the European Union into Britain. As the questions were being presented to David Cameron the other night, people were saying, why is it that unskilled workers that are being put out of work by mismanagement in these other uh, states are given preference over skilled immigrants coming into our country? When we come back, we're going to take a look at what happened uh, in that question and answer period with uh, James, uh, uh, with uh, David Cameron, and uh, we have Lord Moncton talking about the Brexit vote the coming march. up tomorrow. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, and we're talking to Lord Moncton. Of course, the vote as to whether or not Britain is going to remain or leave the European Union is tomorrow. Will it be Britain's Independence Day, as Boris Johnson said in his closing remarks, or will they lose the opportunity? We'll see what happens. It is neck and neck, and of course. They were up by 19 points before the uh, member of parliament was killed uh, last week, one week before the election. And now we've seen a 26-point swing uh, in some of the polls. Right now, they have recovered, and it uh, looks like it is neck and neck. Nobody is uh, predicting that. I, I see that as a very bad sign because we always know that uh, the vested interests are going to be able to swing the votes <laughs> Uh, I, I know that's the case in, in uh, America. We'll ask Lord Moncton what he thinks about that in uh, the U.K. as well. But before we get back to Lord Moncton, I want to point out we've extended the Tim Kennedy special for one more day. That's our 15% off of Super Male Vitality, Brain Force, and Secret 12 at InfoWarsLife.com. These are the products that Tim Kennedy, as you've seen him, talk to Alex Jones. And, of course, he is not only a special forces, but he also uh, is a UFC fighter. And he trains intensively for both of those things. And he says what helps him the most that he has felt the biggest improvement in are these three products, Super Male Vitality, Brain Force, and Secret 12. And so we put those together, call it the Tim Kennedy Special, 15% off. It's been such a big seller. Alex has extended that one more day at InfoWarsLife.com. 15% off Super Male Vitality, Brain Force, and Secret 12. That's the Tim Kennedy Special. Ward Mockton, I want to play this clip uh, from the question and answer period a couple of days ago uh, with David Cameron. And it touches on a huge part of uh, this issue, and of course, that's immigration. Uh, that is an economic issue, as well as a cultural issue, as well as a crime issue. We see what's happening throughout Europe. This is what the people said. Of course, this is a television program. They had an audience. They said it was evenly divided between people who were for and against uh, remaining in the European Union and some people who were uh, undecided, they said. And they let the audience ask questions to David Cameron, the Prime Minister. And here's a couple of those questions real quickly. I want to get your response after we play this. Mr. Cameron, you keep saying that um, you propose to stop immigrants allowed to claim benefits. Is this just a proposal or can you enforce it or have you got to go back to the EU to get it Very enforced? Good it's a great... Yes, sir. 
It's agreed by the 27 other Prime Ministers and Presidents. It's part of what will become a legally binding document. And these changes are coming in. The head of the European Parliament has said that too. Right. So these are things. They come in. If we vote yes to remain in the reformed European Union on Thursday, those proposals get put in front of the European Parliament and start to be passed but what straight happens, away. What happens if somebody vetoes you? Well, they've all agreed they won't. This is, uh, they've all agreed. <laughs> How can we believe that? You say that um, your policy that you've negotiated with Europe cannot be overruled. Yep. It can. So are you really the 21st century Neville Chamberlain waving a piece of paper in the air, <laughs> saying to the public, this is what I have. I have this promise where a dictatorship in Europe can overrule it. Simple question, yes or no, please? Why does they do it? Is the other 27 Prime Ministers and Presidents have agreed it. And they know if Britain votes to remain, they will implement it. And I think, you know, look, this is not some empire and dictatorship. This is we're proving. Hang on, hang on, sir. We're, we're proving. <laughs> there you go. Prove it, prove it. He says you're just a Neville Chamberlain. Waving a piece of paper that has absolutely no effect. You've got a, some promises from these people. They can renege on these promises. He says, uh, well, they, they told me if we stay in, they're going to do something to improve this immigration thing. They're not buying it. Lord Markton, your comments. Imagine if you in the United States were told that you had to depend on the will of 27 other nations, any one of whom could say <laughs> no to you. Yeah. Now, the history of Britain's appeals, for instance, to the so-called European so-called Court of so-called Justice, which is the uh, European Union's rubber stamp court, is that on, in 80% in, in of all cases brought by Britain to try to get its way in the European Union, under David Cameron, it has lost those cases. The average has been 75%, and it's now gone up to 80% that we lose. We have absolutely no influence whatsoever. And on, in, in, in all 72 instances of where uh, the British Parliament has tried to say no under David Cameron to European laws, in every single one of those cases, the European law has been enacted anyway. We have absolutely no say in Europe. And David Cameron is pretending that somehow we are all in the club together and we can do what we want. The fact is the only way we can control immigration, and you're quite right that after democracy, immigration is the next biggest issue. The only way we can control immigration is to come out of the EU. And I'll give you the figures to show you why it is. We are getting something like uh, a million people a year in net terms coming into the UK and staying there. How do we know? Because although the official immigration figures say it's about three or four hundred thousand, the true figures are given by what are called the national insurance numbers issued. And something like 600,000 of those every year are being issued to EU nationals coming to Britain and another 400,000 being issued to foreigners. So who are beyond the EU. So we know that immigration is, is, is at two or three times the rate the official figures show because national insurance numbers, you can't work without one, you can't claim benefit without one. The two things that people want to do when they come to Britain is either to work or to claim benefit. So we know from that that immigration is on a far larger scale than this government wants to admit. We know, it, we know that the vast majority of that immigration is coming just from the 27 other nations of the EU rather than from the 200 other nations worldwide. And so we know that if we want to control immigration, staying in the EU is simply not an option. Those are the hard figures, the figures that don't really get into the papers much. The Daily Telegraph revealed um, this morning or yesterday morning this, this scam by which the government is undercounting immigration by a very, very large scale. And the, the national insurance numbers which allow you to work or to claim benefit are the much more revealing figure. The, uh, the revenue people, the, the, the IRS in the UK, actually keep statistics on who uh, is, these numbers are being allocated to every year. So we know that immigration is happening at a far larger scale than it should, and we know that the only way to control that is to come out. Now, let's look at Cameron's... Uh, saying that he's got the agreement of the other 27 uh, member states. Fact is that all that has to happen now is a coalition 
against us in the European Parliament, because everybody except the uh, Britain wants immigration to continue to be free and easy because they can just export the immigrants straight to Britain, where they all seem to end up, because we have a more generous benefit system, one with far fewer checks on it, and also everybody speaks English, which they don't in most other European countries. So everybody who is an immigrant wants to come to Britain because it's a civilised and friendly place as well. So they may well, in the European Parliament, say, well, we're going to vote this down. Now, of course, the commissars could simply say they were going to push it through anyway, but they don't like Britain, so they probably wouldn't. And what David Cameron is admitting to here is, in effect, is that he has lost control of immigration completely, and he has no control whatsoever about what the European Union will do to us if we remain. The only way we will get control over our immigration is if we come out of the European Union, and then we can tell people from the European Union, how many of them can come in. We'll obviously want skilled workers to come in. We'll want people who are being treated badly by the EU or by any member state to, to uh, come in via the asylum rules, just as we always have done internationally. If you're in hardship and you have nowhere else to turn, Britain will always welcome you. What we're not going to have is this tide of economic migrants. I mean, there'd be another 72 million of them if Turkey joins the EU. Yes. And although Mr. Cameron pretends he doesn't want Turkey to join the EU privately and by behind the scenes. He's been working overtime to try and get Turkey in. He is trying, quite deliberately, to destroy Britain as an independent country so as to establish this world elite dictatorship. If, if anybody is listening thinks this sounds extreme, that is because his ambition is extreme. The ambition of these people is to do away with democracy uh, altogether. And the single biggest threat to their plan is this vote tomorrow. So if you are listening in the United Kingdom or you have friends in the United Kingdom who are dithering about how to vote, tell them that this is their one chance to do not only Britain but also Europe and the world a favour by striking a blow, and a very strong blow, for democracy. And I suppose we might use the words of a well-known film and we might say, we will not go quietly into the night we will not go without a fight. And Good, this hope. will be our Independence Day. Yes, yes, I hope, I hope that will be the case. And of course, uh, as you're talking about immigration, it is not simply the quantity of immigration that is causing economic difficulty, but it's also the quality of immigration. We have an article on Infowars.com. Uh, Calais migrants are rioting and they're chanting F the UK. They demand access to Britain. It's bone chilling footage that shows their car. Uh, some British holiday makers uh, driving through thick clouds of tear gas as French riot police battle in vain to restore control on the road leading to the town's port. And of course, this is something that has been going on for quite some time in Calais. They cannot control the situations going there. As you mentioned, David Cameron wants to have Turkey in. This is something else that came up in this question and answer period. Uh, it, it, as they pointed out, and, and he didn't deny it, he said, uh, yes, I have said that uh, I would very much like for Turkey to be a member of the European Union. They are already a member of NATO. But he goes, that's not going to happen in my lifetime. I can't really see that happening for another 30 years. And you know, Lord Moncton, it reminded me of the uh, Old Testament story about Hezekiah, where he has the Babylonians come to visit him in Jerusalem. And he shows them all the treasures of Jerusalem. And after they leave, uh, Isaiah comes into him and goes, what have you done? And he goes, here's the message from God. He says, these people will take your sons and they will turn them into slaves and eunuchs. And his response is, good, it won't happen in my lifetime. I mean, that's what we're seeing from David Cameron. Hey, great, that it's not going to happen in my lifetime. It'll happen 30 years from now. But it may not happen 30 years from now. It may be sooner. But what a despicable attitude that he would say, fine. We'll let them loot Britain and destroy this country because it won't happen in my lifetime. I'll be able to enjoy this in my lifetime. Well, that is a very nice parallel. The other favorite one I have from, from biblical times is that curious story of the Lord of Life when he went into the desert and the devil visited him there and said, oh, look at this splendid world. I will give all of this to you, if only you follow me. Now, that was a very curious mm -hmm. and rather dumb thing for the devil to say, because, of course, the Lord of Life already owned the world and, indeed, the whole universe. <laughs> Didn't need to be given it by anybody. Uh, and, and so often we are, we are given these 
uh, exaggerated promises by the forces of evil that um, either that something good will happen when they know perfectly well it won't, or that something bad, if it ever were to happen, wouldn't happen in their lifetime. This is the line that the devil always uses to try to buy people's support. Yeah. And talking of buying people's support, that's really what the entire Remain campaign, the people who want to stay in the EU, that's what they've been doing. They've been using two things. One is fear, saying we can't survive on our own in the tough old world if we come out of the EU. Well, <laughs> it wasn't that long ago that we had an empire that covered a quarter of the globe and the sun never set on it. It's not <laughs> as right. though we haven't had practice in making our own way in the world. We still have our special relationship with the United States, despite Mr. Obama having removed the bust of Churchill from the White House. We still have our special relationship with the Commonwealth of Nations, including one nation, Mozambique, that never was part of the British Empire, that applied to join because it liked the friendliness and, and common sense of purpose that the Commonwealth has. And so all of these links that we already have, and of course we also have many friendly links with Europe. One thing you should not ever think, David, is that those of us who are tired of the European Union are anti-European. We are pro-European. I studied uh, the ancient civilizations of Greece and Rome. Uh, and I'm a huge admirer of the contribution that Europe has made to our civilization in music, in art, in architecture, in literature, in science, in so many different fields. Europe has been the cradle of today's civilization. Yes. So why then would I wish to sever myself from it? The answer is I don't. But the European Union is not only anti-democratic, it is anti-European. It stands against the continent that gave the world not only the concept, but also the name of democracy. It stands against the civilization, the Christian civilization, that uh, has been such a gentle force throughout the world, such a force for good on balance. Not that us Christians are perfect by any means, but at least we're trying to be. And this is all rejected by the European Union. So your raising of the, of the biblical quotation there is a very important one. Because although most of our church leaders who are left-wing are therefore in favor of the European Union, some of them are beginning to wake up to the fact that the biggest threat to religion here in Britain is the European Union itself. This is a growing problem now. For yes. instance, no Catholic ends up as a commissar, or very few of them do, because they're subjected to a grilling, a public grilling by the other commissars. And one of the questions they, they tend to get asked is, what is your view about homosexuality? And of course, if you're Catholic, you say, well, I'm terribly sorry, but the church is against it. I'm not against any individual homosexual. But what they do is something that we think is wrong. And it's wrong because it's medically dangerous. And if you say that, you can't become a commissar. So they're already getting into the moral sphere as well as the economic sphere and the political sphere and the democratic sphere and taking over and allowing only one point of view, which is generally a very left wing and very anti-religious point of view, to prevail. And it's not and just in t appointing people into office, as Boris uh, Johnson pointed out. He, he, he went through, a, it was about a month ago, and I, I covered it and, and talked about the parallels between uh, the reasons that he said would be good for Britain to get out of the European Union. And I said, hey, these are all great reasons for Texas to get out of uh, uh, the United States, to secede from the United States. We ought to have a Texit. And uh, actually, there was an article that came out a couple of days ago from The Guardian. I, gu I guess they saw that or they were talking to uh, some Texas uh, uh, independence people and called it Texit. But one of the things that he said was uh, we'd be able to get out from under the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, which is increasingly arbitrating and questions over which we never thought it would have any power like the rights of a child, getting into the family. and So they've got a, a court that is intruding itself into the details of individual life. It's not just excluding people because of their religious beliefs, but it's that kind of intolerance. And, you know, you mentioned Winston Churchill a couple of times as bust. We talked about the issue of, of whether or not uh, David Cameron is acting like Neville Chamberlain. When Winston Churchill talked in the history of the English-speaking people about the American Brexit, uh, our revolution, what he said was it was a liberating force for Britain. He said what it did was it enabled them to strengthen parliamentary democracy. And I think the people you're talking about, there's no animosity, there's no xenophobia about the people of Europe. You don't want to isolate yourself from them. But it is something that the European groups themselves want self-government just like you want it in Britain. And so it would be a, a liberating thing for all of the people of Europe 
That is why the powers that be, the political globalist powers, why all of the industrialists and people like George Soros, all the central bankers are working so hard to defeat this referendum tomorrow. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Lord Moncton, and we're going to have more Trump coverage coming up. In the Welcome back to The Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, and we're talking to Lord Moncton. We're talking about the upcoming election tomorrow, Brexit. Will Britain leave the European Union? Will they vote for freedom for self-government? Or will they be subsumed into this expanding Borg? Now, just before we went to break, uh, we mentioned uh, Texit. And, and Lord Moncton, uh, about a month ago, Boris Johnson, a former mayor of London, came out and gave eight reasons why Britain would be better off outside the European Union. And when he did that, I played each one of the points and I said, you know, what would happen uh, if uh, we left, uh, if Texas left the United States, if we seceded successfully, then like the first uh, point, he says, well, there's 350 million pounds per week that are going to the European Union net uh, that we're losing. And I looked at our numbers and I came up with one and a half billion per week uh, going to the federal government net from Texans. And so we would have that money to spend. So there are all these different parallels. We go step by step and say, hey, why can't we govern ourselves? Texas is 10 times larger than all 13 colonies were uh, combined at the time uh, they did their Brexit. Uh, so uh, clearly we have a much more diversified economy. We have our own energy sources, just as Britain does. We could go it alone as well. Oh, we don't have... Uh, uh, in the Daily uh, Caller a month ago, and uh, I was recommending that Texas should indeed secede. I believe it has uh, a, a right under its own um, constitution when it joined the union to reserve uh, the chance to secede if it ever wished to do so. And I believe it's the only state that has this special privilege. However, under the post-colonial disposition in international law, where the right of self-determination of peoples is paramount, if the people of Texas, which is quite large enough uh, and economically prosperous enough to be viable as an independent state, chose to become independent, whether or not the United States Constitution or the Texas Constitution allows it. If the people of Texas want it, then they should have it. And I know the Republican leadership in Texas rather shabbily managed to die. We're getting a little bit of problem there with the reception on our Skype. It's starting to, to drop out. Uh, let's say, yeah, are we back now? Oh, I'm sorry about that. Yes, yes, we lost uh, you there I'm for a moment you. on Skype. Go ahead. We're back. Okay, I'll just carry on. Um, I was saying that Texit makes a lot of sense. You have the right to secede, even if the United States says you haven't, and even if the Texas Constitution says you haven't. That's if right. the people wish it, under the post-colonial disposition in international law, you are entitled to become independent whenever you wish to do so. Well, Boris so, Johnson is talking about Independence Day. That's what our Declaration of Independence says. I mean, there certainly wasn't any legal authority for them to do it from the British Crown. There wasn't any opportunity from the king to say, well, you can uh, just leave whenever you want to. Uh, they took that exactly. right. They declared that right because they said as, nat as human beings, we have these natural rights that we possess uh, to secure our liberties. That's the reason that we create governments. That's the fundamental basis for our government. So I'm, I'm in favor of anybody having self-government at any level. And that is how international law now works, particularly in the post-colonial era. And I'm going to make you an offer here, David. I'm going to say this. On behalf of Her Majesty and the British government, if Texas would like to leave the United States and rejoin the crown, <laughs> then the only tax you will pay is half a crown a pound on tea. <laughs> and the rest you won't have to pay. Now, you compare that with what your federal government charges, and you see that you'll be better off under the crown than you would under the United States. Well, we would so have that, that uh, taxation with some representation. See, the problem we have now, Lord Moncton, is we have regulation without representation, just as you do in the EU, except ours is coming from the federal bureaucracy. They enact an even larger bureaucratic uh, burden on us than the European Union does on Britain. Stay with us right after the top of the hour. We're going to be back with Lord Moncton for another five minutes. Thank you for sticking around for another five minutes. Then after that, Alex Jones is going to be joining us with more comments about Donald Trump's speech today. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, and we're talking to Lord Moncton. We've been talking about the vote coming up tomorrow as to whether or not Britain will leave the European Union. But now I want to switch gears, and I want to talk to Lord Moncton about another vote that's coming up tomorrow, one that's in California. 
This is a vote as to whether or not California will leave its senses. Well, I should say leave, further leave their senses because they've done it in so many different ways. This is something, of course, we've talked about many times. And Lord Moncton, uh, usually when he comes on, he's talking about climate change. Uh, again, you can find him at scienceandpublicpolicy.org. Scienceandpublicpolicy.org. And what's up with that? That's W A T T S. What's up with that.com. Uh, you can find uh, Lord Moncton's writings there. Now, we've seen Bill Nye come out and say that uh, there needs to be RICO prosecution against people who deny man made global warming. Tomorrow, we have a vote scheduled in California. Uh, the Senate is going to uh, vote on a first-of-its-kind legislation scheduled for floor action tomorrow. Uh, the measure would allow state and local prosecutors to pursue claims against climate change skepticism as a violation of the state's unfair competition law, as well as extend the four-year statute of limitations for such claims retroactively, retroactively to 2021 uh, January the 1st, 2021. The bill, according to the Senate Rules Committee analysis, it says this bill explicitly authorizes district attorneys and the California Attorney General to pursue these claims, alleging that a business or organization has directly or indirectly engaged in unfair competition just because you are engaging in scientific discussion. That is absolutely amazing, Lord Moncton, your comments. Well, that is communism. Yes. And I'm not surprised that California, of all places, should be the first state to try this on. It's also directly contrary, as I understand it, to the First Amendment to your Constitution, which guarantees the right of free speech. Yes. So yeah. I don't think this, this bill, even if it were passed as a sort of gesture to please the communist left, which now infests most of California, I don't think the, even the Obama-tainted Supreme Court could possibly allow such a bill to stand, it would be struck down the first time a case was brought under it. So I don't think that's a realistic um, problem, really. The other thing is, of course, that the one thing that the communist left will not do is take any climate skeptic to court. Because, of course, in a court, whether they like it or not, both sides have to be fairly heard in the way that they're not fairly heard in the mainstream or Marx stream media. The <laughs> fact is that in a court, both sides are fairly heard. And when we uh, took Al Gore's movie to court in the High Court in London, the first the firm of solicitors we tried to engage to do this refused to take the case on the grounds that we had absolutely no chance of winning. And so I was consulted by the people who wanted to bring the case, and I said, well, just find another firm of solicitors, and I will give them a scientific testimony, which will demonstrate that the film is not scientific, it's anti-scientific, it's, it's political, it's left-wing political at that. And under an Act of Parliament, the Education Act 1988, which I helped to draft, when I worked at 10 Downing Street with, with Margaret Thatcher, uh, it's illegal to take sides in politics in schools. You can by all means have political discussions, but you mustn't take sides. And I said that because all these errors in Al Gore's movie pointed in one direction towards undue and anti-scientific alarm, the film shouldn't be shown unless corrective guidance were circulated. We won that case. And exactly the same thing against equity. And they took that case in, in California. I'm sorry, it's breaking up again. Yes, yes, um, we broke up a little bit. Then if they tried to take... Yeah. OK, if they tried to take that case, even to the left-wing judges in California, once they hear the arguments on both sides, they will realise that it is, in fact, the communist left and the climate change extremists who are wrong and the sceptics who are correct. The truth will out. Thank you so much, Lord Moncton, and I hope that you vote for your Independence Day tomorrow. We'll all be watching. All the eyes of the world will be on Britain tomorrow. We'll be right back.